Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this year's Tanner Lectures at, at Yale University, I, hosted by the Whitney Humanities Center. I'm Gary Tomlinson. I'm the director of the Whitney. We're gathered, of course, to hear from Achille Mbembe, who is a research professor at the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa, and more specifically at the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research, WISER, as it is known. And we're delighted, by the way, to have the director of WISER, Professor Sarah Nuttall, with us also today. Sarah. I've known Professor Mbembe since we were colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania some 25 years ago, and it's a huge pleasure for me to welcome him to this stage today. I know we are in for today, tomorrow, and Thursday not only an intellectual feast, but something more, since Professor Mbembe has in his many writings, it's not too much to say, recast the terms of post-colonial analysis and critique. This achievement is particularly marked in his most recent book, but one, Critique of Black Reason, where he leads us to understand blackness not only as a project of the imagination shaped by half a millennium of subjugation, enslavement, exploitation, murder, but also as the condition that all the world's subaltern people are subjected to today by the forces of neoliberal capital. But I leave further introduction of Professor Mbembe to my colleague, Michael Denning. To me, it's left to outline the schedule of Tanner events over the next two days and to say a few words about the Tanners as an institution. This afternoon, we hear the first of Professor Mbembe's two lectures. Afterwards, you're all invited to a reception here at the Whitney. It's straight down the hall directly behind you. Tomorrow, again at 5 o'clock, Professor Mbembe will present his second lecture. And after that, there will be a short question and answer session. And then on Thursday morning, finally, at 10.30, we reconvene for a discussion among Professor Mbembe, Professor Denning, and another Yale professor, Inderpal Gruel. At that session, there will be additional opportunity for questions from the audience. As to the Tanner Lectures on Human Values, they were established by the American scholar, industrialist, and philanthropist, Obert Clark Tanner, and his wife, Grace Tanner. For many years, a professor at the University of Utah and a scholar of the New Testament educated at Harvard and Stanford, Tanner also founded in 1927, early in his adulthood, a jewelry company in Salt Lake City. The company later expanded into broad areas of human resource consulting and employee recognition programs. They made trophies and, and placards and so on for 25 years of service and things like that, and from that made a whole lot of money, and it is on the base of that corporation that the Tanner Foundation and Obert and Grace Tanner's philanthropic efforts are built. These efforts include today the Tanner Lectures at Yale and at a number of other universities in the United States, Great Britain, and beyond. The purpose Obert Tanner envisaged for the Tanner Lectures is to advance and reflect upon scholarly and scientific learning relating to human values. In creating the lectureships, Professor Tanner knowingly left his purview very broad. He wrote, I see these lectures simply as a search for a better understanding of human behavior and human values. This understanding may be pursued for its own intrinsic worth, but it may also eventually have practical consequences for the quality of personal and social life." Unquote. Appointment as a Tanner lecturer is a recognition of uncommon achievement and outstanding abilities in the area of human values and studies. And we are honored to add Professor Mbembe to the list of distinguished scholars and humanists whom Yale has so recognized. At Yale, the Tanner Lectures are selected by the president in consultation with the director and executive committee of the Whitney Humanities Center. So we're also indebted to Yale President Peter Salovey, who will be here tomorrow night, for his assistance in bringing today's speaker to us. Now it's my pleasure to welcome to the podium Michael Denning, William R. Keenan, Jr., Professor of American Studies and English, to introduce our speaker. Michael. Thank you, Gary. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Ashil Mbembe back to Yale to deliver the Tanner Lecture, Borders in the Age of Networks. Uh, I won't repeat that he's a research professor at Witz Ron. I'll just say, I last introduced Ashil to a Yale audience in 2007. And in the decade since, he has published three major books. And I thought I'll start with those rather than going way back. The first in 2010 was Sortie de la Grande Nuit, an allusion to Fanon's call to shake off the great mantle of night. 
essai sur l'Afrique décolonisée, essay on decolonized Africa. Not yet translated into English, it opens with an extraordinarily powerful autobiographical narrative of a country and three cities. First, and please excuse my halting translations, I hope they're accurate. Born in the shadow of a country without a proper name, Cameroon, the name given by Portuguese seamen marveling at the abundance of shrimp, Camaro, in the river. And born in the shadow of, and I quote, the first age of post-colonialism, its childhood and adolescence. And in the shadow of songs of lamentation for the disavowed martyrs of the anti-colonial struggle and the schoolroom anthems of the post-colonial nation and potentate. Then, as with intellectuals, and I quote, since the time of Fanon, Césaire, and Senghor, having taken his masters at the University of Yaoundé, he left for Paris, where he took his doctorate at the Sorbonne, and New York, where he taught at Columbia, and where, I won't summarize his luminous pages on what those two cities meant to him, he became a historian not only of the resistance in Cameroon, editing a collection of the writings of the marbid, martyred Ruben Um Nioba, and publishing in 1996 The Birth of the Resistance in South Cameroon, but of the surpluses of post-colonial Africa. And he forged the remarkable dialectic of historical reflection and critical theory that has come to characterize his style in first on the post colony, translated into English, published in 2000, and translated into English in 2001. But then, in the last year of the 20th century, as he puts it, he arrived in South Africa. In the shadow, and I'm quoting here again, the maelstrom, in the shadow of the maelstrom that was apartheid. Its statues still standing, its streets not yet renamed. In a city, Johannesburg, the most modern, most powerful, and most racially mixed of African metropolises, a new frontier of the continent where one finds almost all the nationalities of the world. A migrant to Johannesburg, it is from Johannesburg that Ashil Mbembe has, over the last two decades, reimagined our world. In his account of Africa's attempt to shake off the great mantle of night, in his extraordinary 2013 book, Critique of Black Reason, which has just been translated into English, a philosophical history of the invention of black reason, the Western consciousness of Africa in blackness in the shadow of the slave trade and colonialism, of the reversal of that black reason into the black reason that is the polyglot internationalism of the modern black imaginary in figures from Garvey and Du Bois to Fanon and Mandela, and finally to the becoming black of the world. And most recently in the 2016 book, The Politics of Enmity, a chapter of which, which has been recently translated in Radical Philosophy, a reflection on a world dominated by the desire for an enemy, a desire for apartheid, a desire for separation and exclusion and walls, and the new forms of nano-racism and hydraulic racism that that world has shaped. Throughout all his work, he has been haunted by death and corpses. Necropolitics has been one of his most influential essays. And death stretches across his work from the cemeteries in Cameroon to the amazing essay on Mandela's mortality written together with Sarah Nuttall. However, recalling the songs of lamentation of his grandmother for the son assassinated in the resistance, he writes that these songs serve to accompany his shadow and to open for him a way to a possible repose in compensation for the unspeakable injustice the victim experienced after his demise. In a similar way, Achille Mbembe's writings accompany the shadows of the dead and undead of our world 
and open a way to a possible repose, an in common, as he calls it, beyond the unspeakable injustices of a society of enmity. Please join me in welcoming Ashil Mbembe for the first of his two Tanner lectures, The New Global Mobility Regime. to uh, thank uh, Gary and the university for uh, a very gracious invitation. Um, as Gary said, we, we were <laughs> both uh, colleagues many, many years ago. He said 25 years, and I suddenly realized that uh, time has been <laughs> um, passing rather, rather quickly. But as you can uh, testify, Gary uh, looks, always looks very young, uh, both physically and in his mind. Uh, Gary was uh, and has been all along. Uh, his work has been a great inspiration for, for a lot of us. I would also like to extend my gratitude to, to Michael. Uh, I like Michael very, very much. Um, I know he likes me too. <laughs> as you, you could see uh, with uh, his, his introduction. Um, and I'm very glad my, my wife, uh, Sarah Natal, uh, is here. Um, perhaps more than uh, <clears throat> any other, uh, ours is, is an epoch of fantasies. Uh, one such fantasy is that of uh, total security or a perfectly controlled or tightened borders, the dream of uh, impenetrable and insurmountable limits, which is uh, the same thing as the dream of uh, a domain without an outside, uh, a domain whose walls cannot be broken through and uh, whose boundaries can never be crossed, if only because uh, they are continuously redrawn, uh, displaced, and, uh, and pushed back. So as the uh, twin logics of order and security on the one hand, and uh, freedom and movement on the other, confront one another, Borders almost everywhere are increasingly found in unexpected places. In the not so distant past, borders have always been generative of new modes of power and a new political reason. Such was the case in 1884-1885 when meeting in Berlin for what was then known as the uh, Congo Conference, 14 European powers divided Africa among them for the purpose of colonization. This they did by carving out the entire continent and by superimposing on pre-existing political entities and cultures a hodgepodge of geometric boundaries that divided it into 50 aberrant countries. As clearly pointed out in the general act of the conference, this was all, a quote, in the name of free trade and civilization. As Article 2 of that general act of the conference specifies, a quote again, all flags without distinction of nationality, shall have free access to the whole of the coastline of the territories above enumerated, enumerated in Article 1, to the rivers there running into the sea, to all the waters of the Congo and its effluence, 
including the lakes, and to all the ports situated on the banks of these waters, as well as to all the canals which may in future be constructed with intent to unite the watercourses or lakes within the entire area of the territories described in Article 1, end of quote. The said Article 1 starts with the following statement, I quote again, the trade of all nations shall enjoy complete freedom. Follows a geographical specification, which is at the same time a naming of a large boundary and the claiming of a huge chunk of territory called the Basin of the Congo. And so it goes. A new mode of power, a new political reason, but even more crucially, a claim made in relation to an assemblage of territories, territories made of uh, rivers, of mountains, ridges and watersheds, lakes, maritime zones, lines, parallels and latitudes, points of demarcation, and assemblage of territories power is seeking to take possession of. So at the beginning, or at least in our colonial experience, the raison d'etre of the border is to attend to the problem of the distribution of the earth. How must the earth of land be distributed? To whom does the earth belong? Who can lay what type of claim to what part of it? To whom should be allotted what share? Who determines its distribution or partition? In its colonial roots, geopolitics is about the multiple distributions of populations, not only human, on the body of the earth. It is about the modes of occupation and redistribution of the earth and the manner in which these modes affect the vital forces of all kinds of beings, human and non-human. Yesterday, borders used to manifest themselves in two major ways. First, as tangible physical features, usually located at the edge of state territory. And second, as sites where discretionary sovereign decisions were made in relation to whether to permit or to exclude what, whom, and under what terms. Nowadays, they are ever more mobile, complex, differentiated, dispersed, and fractalized, just as they remain contested. As more and more people find themselves on the move, new laws, regulations, bureaucracies, and procedures are produced in a renewed attempt at controlling and regulating their movements through and across the borderscapes of our world, and in an effort at setting the terms under which foreign bodies might enter, reside, work, settle, and perhaps integrate in countries other than their own. Migration policy, which is mostly about the control of human mobility, is once again seen as a key index of sovereignty in a world of flows, risks, and threats. Furthermore, border work, the work of instituting enacting boundaries, understood mostly as uh, powers highly uneven, imperfect, and yet incessant labor to contain mobility, border work is ever more incorporated into everyday ways of life. It is enhanced by numerous security schemes and technologies supposedly configured to operate objectively schemes objectively, that is, without prejudice or, or discrimination. Such security technologies 
are enlisted in what is increasingly an automated calculation of threats, a key feature of our times. They are configured in such a way as to track, unveil, and sort that which is hidden, that which must be detected and inspected, that which is out of place or unauthorized, concealed identities, aberrant movements, categories of potential enemies, actual human bodies in this age of generalized suspicion. Indeed, this is also an epoch when the human body, or more precisely that body that is not mine, re-emerges as potentially dangerous, and meshed as it is with various figures of threat and insecurity, threat to cultural identity, threat to the welfare state, threat to public order, and even an existential threat to our way of life and our way of being. According to the new old security rationale, although everybody is potentially dangerous until proven otherwise, some categories of bodies and persons carry almost by definition more risks than others. Even at their most vulnerable state, they fundamentally endanger our lives. As such, they must be the object of renewed profiling, classification, and isolation, or even eliminated in line with a long history in modernity that ties together the targeting, quarantining, restriction, and even extermination of populations that have been marked as abnormal or have been profoundly dishonored. The obsession with the borders of the human body, in particular the borders of that body that is not mine, has in turn unleashed a renewed algorithmic production of its nude image by fully body scanners and its examination on screens at a time when security is equated with visibility and concealment with threat. What the body looks like, what its parts are, what are its shapes and forms, what objects is it concealing, and what others shouldn't it, these are questions the new matrix of threat and risk is forcing us to ask with urgency. So over the last uh, 15 years, a huge amount of uh, empirical work has been done in relation to both borders and migration, and it is not my intention to rehearse it here. The wealth of data already accumulated has helped sharpen our understanding of mobility and of borders, of capture, immobility, and flight. It has also highlighted the extent to which various processes are unfolding simultaneously, the freeing of internal mobility for some, and the hardening of external boundaries for others, uh, phenomena such as the uh, re-specialization of state sovereignty, the uh, securitization of, of migration, the uh, merging of criminal justice and immigration policing, the uh, extraterritorialization of certain practices related to migration management. These and other processes have been the object of extensive and careful descriptions. Drawing from this material, it seems to me it's now possible to rethink what is at stake when the uh, biopolitics of mobility intersects with the geopolitics of our times, uh, the kind of political reason that is produced at this intersection. In other words, what is it that contemporary migratory struggles tell us about the border regimes of our times, 
and the apparatuses of control and capture of bodies, capture of motion, capture of speed, and ultimately capture of life itself in the current conjunction. These are some of the questions I would like to examine during these lectures. I will be using, at times interchangeably, such terms as borders, uh, migration, mobility, movement. These are uh, obviously technical t concepts. Borders are at the front line of present day geopolitics. They are also the sites where sovereignty is the most subject to reanimation. To be sure, uh, the long established concept of territorial, physical, or political boundary of a state still has relevance in a world in which uh, lines, enclaves, and compartments have not entirely disappeared. Uh, the lines that continue to separate us uh, are still there, but boundaries or borders are no longer conceived merely as walls or fences. Even when they manifest themselves as tangible physical features located at the edge of state territory, they are increasingly understood as a, a contingent uh, assemblage of, of social practices uh, subject to, to change. They are increasingly understood as relational arrangements of bodies uh, in spaces and not only as, as containers. In fact, as argued by many, the discretionary sovereign decisions that are uh, taken at borders are uh, ultimately the result of various interactions uh, between uh, border guards, uh, detection devices, sniffer dogs, uh, humans, non-humans. Um, bordering actions or practices uh, in that sense represent provisional stabilization of various forces and devices, forces with uh, uh, competing understandings of, of threat, uh, forces whose function is to enact or perform security uh, in the can face of uh, cunning and uh, supposedly merciless enemy others. Um, so a border in this sense is the result of how mobility control regimes use difference to constitute different spatial uh, practices. So the point I, I'm trying to make is that, uh, as a matter of fact, there is no homogenizing border logic. There, there isn't. Uh, difference and territoriality are always practiced in fractured and par partial ways. At least that is one thing we draw from the uh, voluminous amount of research uh, I was referring to. This having been said and taken together, these terms, borders, mobility, movement, and so on, these terms all mean one thing. The uh, multiple distributions of human populations on the body of the earth. That's how I understand these terms. They all refer to the same thing, the monitoring of the movements of the populations that circulate on the surface of the earth or that happen to settle somewhere for various reasons. But in my understanding, what is ultimately at stake in the current planetary politics of mobility is the drawing of the new limits of the earth. In this context, the main function of borders is precisely to push outside, to throw outside that body that is not mine, or to put it in Heidegger's terms, the wrong people with the wrong blood. That's Heidegger's expression. In this sense, the border has the status 
of law. To be sure, border does not only exclude or separate, it can also connect, but overall, a border is in the last instance always conceived in its disjunctive use. It always refers in the last instance to those populations coming from the outside and in relation to which it must act as a filter or which it actually threatens. So I start from the assumption that any form of mobility finds its limit at the border. The border is that which interrupts movement or motion. And in modernity, border control has played two decisive functions, has been a key device in the planetary management of populations. Um, it has also been a key vector for the configuration of various degrees of subjecthood, flow and distribution of bodies, the constitution of subjects without rights, and a preeminent site for the execution of state violence. The limit where life matters the most. So the questions I'm asking are the following. To what new existences do borders bear witness in our contemporary world? Why, in the confrontation with borders, why do so many people, why are they compelled towards experimenting at the limits of the livable? This way of framing the issue is markedly different from the three approaches that have of late dominated debates on mobility in the age of borders and networks. Of the various trends that have of late dominated such debates, three in particular should be highlighted. A first trend centered around the concept of precarity or precarious lives has sought to delineate the interconnections between neoliberal work and welfare regimes, immigration controls, and the exploitation or hyper-exploitation of international migrant labor. Today, indeed, more than at any other moment of our recent history, migrants are centrally implicated in highly precarious work experiences at the bottom end of labor markets, not only uh, in Western capitalist countries, but also in various parts of the global south, as the case uh, in South Africa, as the case in Gulf countries, uh, and so forth and so on. The concept of precarity has been mobilized in an effort to describe those life worlds epitomized by migrant existence, an existence that is uh, inflected with uncertainty and instability, it is a concept that has been understood both as a descriptor and as a condition, a condition, let me repeat, which itself is a consequence of neoliberal globalization and related transformations in the world of work. And precarity in this instance has been used as a key explanatory framework for new forms of workplace exploitation. The idea that the life of the migrant at the bottom end of the labor ladder, ladder is the metaphor of precarious life, this idea uh, refers to something more than a position in the labor market. Precarity has also been understood as something intertwined with other areas of life, something almost existential, which speaks to the inability to predict one face, one's, one's fate, or to enjoy uh, the degree of stability on which to build social relations and feelings of affection. Precarity has finally been understood as a condition of structural insecurity, as a consequence of uh, differential exposure to violence and suffering that emanates 
from social political context. That's the first way in which the question of mobility, borders, migrancy has been dealt with through the lens of uh, this concept of precarity. A second strand of debates on migration has focused on emerging geographies of detention, imprisonment, and confinement. In other words, the carceral landscapes of our world. The idea here is that a migrant, a body on the move in a way that is not authorized, is almost by definition likely to end up in one form or another of a prison, to be detained, confined, deported, is part of the options he or she permanently faces. The driving concept in this case has been that of categorical vulnerability. Indeed, during 2009 alone uh, in the US, approximately 380,000 people spent time uh, in the vast and continuously expanding migrant detention system. According to Detention Watch Network, this system consisted then of approximately 350 facilities operating at an annual cost of more than 1.7 billion US dollars. In other countries such as the UK, the use of migrant detention in the form of asylum screening units has expanded. Across the European Union, detention facilities have similarly proliferated and now number in the hundreds, while Australia has intensified detention practices on and offshore. In short, the world has witnessed a significant expansion of landscapes of detention over the last decade. So has been the growth of detention structures along transnational routes traveled by migrants in their journeys through Northern Africa, Eastern Europe, Indonesia, and Central America. Simultaneously, detention and deportation have become more than ever interlocked industries. In this context, an important strand of studies on borders and mobility has been preoccupied with the extent to which the categorical vulnerability to which migrants and undocumented people are subjected to what extent is this category legally produced? Then there is a third strand which has focused on the warehousing of refugees and asylum seekers. Here too, the number of people in the world fleeing conditions of war, violence, disasters, economic distress, and environmental collapse has been swelling. In 2014, the number of forcibly displaced people in the world surpassed the record number uh, of people displaced in the aftermath of the Second World War. I think the latest figures uh, we have ha had last year uh, flag, uh, let's see, uh, we are told that there are 65 million people, 65 million refugees uh, in search of asylum in our world uh, as we, we speak. Whatever, uh, so from whatever angle one examines it, the border therefore remains a biopolitical space. And in a number of instances, border crossing has become a matter of life and death. In such a context, humanitarian border work's goal is not to abolish border controls or to contest the border as a space of exercise of sovereign power, but to turn it into a space both of rescue and of provision of basic uh, emergency uh, care. The rescaling and outsourcing of borders is not only happening inland. 
It is also happening offshore, especially on deserts and islands, where high measures of enclosure uh, aim at shutting down paths to asylum or containing people trying to reach sovereign territories in ever smaller and more remote locations. Such is notably the case with Europe's southern peripheries. In, in particular, the two Spanish enclaves of Ceuta and Melilla. In Melilla, following the arrival of the first group of African migrants, Spain built a three meter high fence, 12 kilometers square uh, in, in Melilla, which is a, a 12 uh, kilometer square enclave, uh, which is located in fact in, in northeastern Morocco, uh, which has been under Spanish sovereignty since uh, the late 15th century. A few years later, the EU financed the construction of a six meter high, three uh, tier fence, equipped with manned control posts, infrared cameras, acoustic sensors, and motion detectors. The EU also put pressure on Morocco to control its side of the border. In response, Morocco initiated regular military cleanup operations, most of which uh, consisted in putting migrants in trucks, taking them to uh, the city of Oujda, uh, further down south, near the border with Algeria, and dumping them there, or in the desert. A key component of the strategy of outsourcing, European border control has expanded outwardly with the assistance of third countries at the same time as uh, internal border control is strengthened through surveillance agencies, increased rates of deportation, and the proliferation of internment centers. As far as outsourcing is concerned, the Moroccan government has been building its own barbed wire fence, a fence partially financed by the EU subsidies allocated to Spain for border control. The same thing is happening as we speak uh, throughout the Sahara Desert in places such as Niger, Libya of course, uh, Burkina Faso, and along the coast of Senegal. Typical of the distinctly neoliberal articulation between securitization and free market internationalism, the same countries that are determined to secure their borders are actively engaged in the construction of free trade partnerships with the very same neighbors from whom they seek to protect themselves, which raises, of course, the question of selective permeability. Uh, in other words, uh, of whose interest the opening or closing of border uh, serves. I could go on and on on the case of these two enclaves and the islands, or talk a bit more about the desert. But the point I really want to make is that uh, the three strands I have evoked all point towards one thing. They point towards the fact that a reworking and rescaling of borders is in the making. And it is in the making at a planetary level, globally. It is in the making as a result of the emergence of a new mobility regime, one which is planetary in scale. And I would now like to say a few words about this uh, new mobility regime. I have gone to some length describing the ways in which islands enter into this new calculus of mobility. I also alluded to the extent to which deserts are implicated in the same process. I would now like to focus on what we should more broadly call the liquid frontier. 
because the liquid frontier is at the avant-garde of the redefinition of sovereignty in the contemporary world. In order to understand the liquid frontier and how it reorganizes sovereignty and contributes to the making of a new global mobility regime, an excursion through Carl Schmitt's Nomos of the Earth is necessary. If only because uh, for Schmitt, the fundamental distinction on which geopolitics has been predicated, geopolitics in the sense of the distribution of the earth, the distribution of the earth, which I equated with mobility and borders at the beginning, even because for him, geopolitics has been predicated uh, on a binary division between a solid land where territories can be clearly demarcated and where order uh, may be imposed and the sea. So the land on the one hand, the sea on, on the other, where borders, according to Schmidt, in any case, uh, can be neither traced nor held and where in Schmittian imaginary, uh, freedom reigns absolute. That's how he understands uh, uh, see, the sea. Of course, this is an idealization of the sea. The sea as uh, an empty, almost uh, abstract and frictionless geometric space uh, open to navigation. Question of navigation, which we found too when I was referring to uh, the carving of, of Africa uh, during the Berlin Conference. So this idealization, of course, it has been critiqued. Uh, in fact, as we know, now realize, uh, oceans hardly cover space evenly. Uh, oceans are, in fact, a fabric that is full of holes. Uh, it is stitched together out of pieces. Uh, the sea is, if you want, a tangle of strings. That we know now. Schmidt might not have known about this, but at least now we have the advantage of, of knowing, knowing better than he did. But the liquid territory of the sea nevertheless offers a number of particularities. First, because Water covers over 70% of the surface area of our planet. Many frontiers in the world today are located in the sea. That's the first, first point. Second, the sea is what we can, we can get in terms of the idea of an absolute boundary. All boundaries are relative. But if we were to imagine, if only for a second, what an absolute boundary might look like, we have to look not on land, but on the sea. It is the only absolute boundary because it alone <coughs> uh, blocks the, uh, the continuous expansion of, of a people, it alone. Uh, Deleuze and Guattari believe that the desert does that better than the sea. But these are discussions we can uh, explore later. So the sea does that, and, and yet it can be domesticated to bring people into contact. It enables circulation while adding friction to movement, while adding friction to life. The other interesting thing with the sea, I, I lay down all of this and then I will draw the conclusion at the end and see where I'm going. The third interesting thing with the sea, uh, according to Schmidt, is that, of course, it is stirred by currents and, and waves, and by being stirred by currents and waves, 
it seems to erase any trace, including traces of the past, or to relegate and contain them at its very bottom. Um, and because of this apparent permanent erasure of all traces, the sea seems to maintain everything in a kind of permanent present, according to Schmidt. Furthermore, still with Schmidt, part of what characterizes this vast expanse is the lack of stable habitation on its surface. I mean, this was probably before the uh, oil, oil digging, uh, oil extraction, uh, which, which today allows for I mean, inhabitations on the surface, but okay, we, we are not yet there with Schmidt. He's still writing at a time when this doesn't seem at all possible. And because of this lack of stable habitation, I quote him, events at sea occur mostly outside of the public gaze and thus remain unaccounted for. This lack of accountability uh, as a, a characteristic feature of what happens uh, at sea. Even more importantly, throughout modernity, maritime governance has always oscillated between two poles. On the one hand, the desire to divide up the waters of the earth in a way that would mirror the carving up of territorial boundaries on land. And on the other hand, the vision of the ocean as open to free navigation, the so-called free seas. Uh, Hugo Grotius wrote about in his uh, you know, text, uh, Mare Liberium. Whatever the case, Schmidt was wrong. I mean, wrong. He wasn't wrong. Uh, um, he got stuck. Let's put, let's put it like that. Uh, with his distinction, with his land sea binary. Um, What has happened of late is that the new modes of regulation of human mobility have uh, tried to go beyond this land-sea binary by uh, being attuned more than ever before to the vertical dimensions of maritime spaces. And in so doing, we are nowadays able to decipher a much more complex form of governance than the simple opposition between territorial control and deterritorialized flows. What I mean by this is that in the new regimes of mobility, many have uh, come to the realization that, in fact, territorial control can go hand in hand with deterritorialized flows. What we have today, therefore, is a far more complex jurisdictional regime and mode of government, governance in which the rights and obligations that compose modern state sovereignty on the land are decoupled from each other and applied to varying degrees depending on the spatial extent and the specific issue in question. This is what uh, Saskia Sassen calls unbundled sovereignty. And this partial sovereignty regime intersect with ever-shifting lines of control in which routes and traffic have become key. What does it mean? It means that in the making of the new regime of mobility, motion 
has been put at the center. And if you want to control the migration of people, what you have to follow as carefully as possible and trace is the movement of people along routes and intersections along their journeys. So sovereignty and governance attempt now to be exercised on routes and traffic, to follow those routes, to police them, while policing in the same way uh, uh, high seas are, 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 are policed. So, sovereignty in this case has to do with the negotiation of the uh, inextricable articulation between freedom and control, which is characteristic in, indeed of forms of mobility uh, governance in neoliberal societies. And these sets of, of lines do not some simply coexist. In fact, the carving up of partial sovereignty regimes is the very basis for governance in motion. I have used the sea to show the extent to which it has become a laboratory in which contemporary modes of mobility control have been devised and experimented with, which are now being brought to bear on the land. So what used to be done exclusively at sea is now uh, done uh, on land. Uh, on the land, uh, as at sea, border functions on the land have been decoupled from the limits of the territorial border and are becoming increasingly dispersed and mobile, able to follow ever-shifting routes. That's what uh, is the kernel of the new mobility regime. Now, one of the most significant transformations in terms of the geopolitics of mobility is without doubt the blurring of inside outside and the extent to which borders have been externalized and the border has become a transnational assemblage. A number of authors speak in this regard about the emergence of a territorially extended, increasingly informal and itinerant bordering assemblage of institutions, state authorities, policies that react to dynamic and turbulent migratory movements. At the same time, uh, the outsourcing, offshoring, and extraterritorialization of border work has led to a spatial and legal stretching of the domains of migration control and a redefinition of the jurisdictions and authorities traditionally associated with border management. Uh, we see it in places such as Senegal, uh, Mauritania, Niger, uh, Burkina Faso, Morocco, Algeria, Libya, uh, where um, the, the shifting performance of sovereignty entails the ability for the security forces of European countries to act in tandem uh, with the uh, forces of these third states uh, in an attempt at cutting off the rules of migration. Of course, all of this raises all kinds of dilemmas, uh, these forms of mobile sovereignty, uh, the legal and institutional foundations for uh, such programs remain uh, unclear, particularly with the near permanent basing of operational border control and policing. Foreign forces uh, 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 are involved in in other states. Now, let me move on and come back to the question of the body uh, with which I started. I indicated that the rescaling of uh, borders has entailed 
a global expansion of security infrastructure, ranging from physical and virtual walls to the deployment of drones and military hardware to monitor and secure space. Um, I uh, argued that uh, a novel migration regime is emerging, which requires, as I tried to show uh, through the uh, reference to the sea, which requires a, a nonlinear understanding of territory. I, uh, I also argued that uh, uh, the inside can now be outside, the sea on land, and the land on sea, and what we used to take as close can be far away and vice versa. All of this geometry is fast changing, and it's changing as a consequence. The old models of sovereignty uh, understood at an earlier period as uh, control over people, taxes, and discrete territories. What I would like to add now has to do with the extent to which, in a world of technology-enabled flows, sovereignty over discrete territories has become almost by definition incomplete. Many governments, especially in the North, have understood that in order to govern the movement of people across borders, it is absolutely crucial to first classify them. Today, one of the most efficient ways to achieve such a goal is through the harvesting and strategic use of electronic personal data. The purpose of classification is to bring back bodies into a zone of calculation and manageability. This is the reason why in the new regime of human mobility I'm referring to, Bordering practices have become digitized through the automation of data collection and data analysis. So what is being collected, genetic information, it is stored in electronic form in searchable bases, uh, physiological features unique to uh, individuals such as fingerprints, uh, patterns of the iris, uh, the retina, the veins of the hand, uh, physiognomic features such as voice patterns are transformed uh, via uh, algorithms to produce so-called templates. Uh, these templates in turn are stored uh, in centralized databases that are accessed when, uh, uh, whenever necessary. And uh, um, templates are, when they are not stored centrally, uh, they are put on a chip, inserted into all kinds of documents, such as passports and identity cards. So in this context, to, to classify consists in converging the data from integrated bases with biometric identifiers such as those I have, I have mentioned. And uh, classification in this instance relies obviously on uh, a series of dividing practices in which the, the subject is, is broken up into calculable risk factors. In other words, to classify, which is a very old exercise, but to classify today, is to categorize populations into degrees of riskiness. And uh, uh, classification uh, mostly has to do with a preemptive fixing of identities. So thanks to the uh, biometric turn, governments are embedding their regulatory functions in various networks of global flows with the help of 
digital technologies so that uh, sovereignty, prerogatives, can travel with the flows. Um, so to old models of, uh, old model based on the actual physical control of discrete territories, they are grafting a new model of mobile and flowing sovereignty. In this new model, linear border functions are dislocated and pushed both outward into, as I said, other states' territories and inward into national uh, societies. Now, this new border regime, moving towards the end now, uh, has produced several significant uh, spatial outcomes. Borders have become more mobile, but more importantly, borders have become portable. Thus, opening the entire space of the globe to potential bordering processes. What I mean by that is that borders have no limits. They, no longer, they are no longer limits to bordering processes. Um, there has been an increase in bordering instances as people can now encounter borders in various forms in a multitude of locales within their daily lives. The nature of an individual's encounter with borders has also changed since this is often mediated by diverse digital devices and managed more and more by private actors. So border control has become more individualized, more molecular, almost cellular, as digitization allows surveillance to zero in on the smaller spaces such as the body and continuously monitor the body. Now the question is the following. Why is it that border security practices have taken such a keen interest in the connection between the human body and identity as a means of uh, achieving detailed control of a movement? This is the case because the human body is seen as an indisputable anchor to which data can be safely secured. So as a result, we are witnessing a gradually extending intertwinement of individual physical characteristics with information systems, a process that has served to deepen faith in data as a means of risk management and faith in the body as a source of absolute identification. The idea is that the body remains the truth of the individual. If you want to know who you are, we better open your body. Uh, so digital devices, the work they are doing is similar to a work of dissection. Uh, this is what is at stake in the extension of the biometric border into multiple realms of soci social life, in particular into the human body. The most efficient way to regulate mobile bodies is to turn them into portable borders. Let me conclude. The argument I wanted to make tonight was pretty straightforward. The function of the border, of any border, is to simultaneously divide and define and in so doing, to generate new sets of relationships between the socio-spatial entities and the actual bodies they bring into existence. Borders do not simply enclose, they also provide an instrument to gain access to, or bar access to, an evenly geographically distributed resources. As I will show tomorrow, the tension between mobility and immobility is itself 
intrinsic to the workings of global capital. I was particularly interested in the question of the body at the border and the borders of the body, especially that body that is not mine. Most of the bodies in motion in our contemporary world, the multiplicity of bodies attempting to break through the wall are engaged in an old struggle, the struggle to sustain life under catastrophic conditions, rendered superfluous by the volatile forces and flows of capital. They are desperately trying to escape places that have been rendered uninhabitable. Catastrophic conditions should be defined as those under which each life and every breath suddenly acquires an utmost value, caught as they are in the nexus of vulnerability and emergency. What a body is and what a body might become find the limit uh, precisely at that border of vulnerability and emergency. Thank you very much for your attention.